three days to three days and we come to this. But okay, now I already started, uh, so I will review, switch back to the beginning. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to be here again this year and to see some of the familiar faces, uh, also from the last year. So I'm afraid that perhaps in the next, what is it, 18 or 20 hours, some of the things that we'll, we were discussing last year will come up again, so, but not too many, so I don't think there will be a little bit of repetition, I'm afraid, for some of you, perhaps, for some of you. Uh, so the, the themes that I will be uh, discussing this year, actually there are two general themes very much related together and linked together, as you will see. Uh, one could be put under the general heading of the real, the real as first and foremost defined in the Lacanian theory. You know, there is this famous identification of the real with the impossible. So what is this? Real is the impossible. What is its relationship with whatever the symbolic, the discursive? Is it simply something beyond all this? So the, the, the theme of the real will, will be one of the uh, general headings and the question of negation, negativity, um, in its relationship also to affirmation, the other, and the relationship will somehow be established through the fact that I will try to argue for maybe a specific uh, characteristic of negation that could be conceptualized or seen as precisely formulating, bringing forth affirmatively something of, of the real. So in more uh, general way, then through these two headings, via speaking about them, so we'll touch the, the topics of the uh, real as impossible, as I said, the question of the singular and its possible repetition or double, the relationship between symbolic reality or discursive reality and the real question of repetition, as I said, then also, question of the double, the dead drive and atheism, but I think this will, I will probably save this for the, this evening lecture, this bit. Then the question of uh, philosophical realism, so to say, of this revival of the realism in contemporary philosophy, here I'm speaking mainly referring to Kentame Yasu and Ray Brassier's um, conceptualizations of this. And the relationship of this kind of uh, relationship between, through these topics, uh, philosophy or psychoanalysis on one hand and science and the real in science on the other, through this the question of necessity, contingency, and also a question of sexual difference as precisely pertaining to this same, let's say, um, Lacanian family of something that gets us very close to what he calls the real. The, the, uh, then, uh, uh, also will, I will go a little bit through Nietzsche's singular take on this or role on the, in this. Uh, and then we'll move on to the question of negation, negativity, affirmation, also as you know, to a certain extent, a Nietzschean theme. Uh, but we'll start off from Freud, actually, in this piece on Verneinung, which was uh, commented on by uh, Jani Polit. This was also on this list, but anyway, there is a short commentary. Lacan at some point invited the philosopher, the French philosopher of Hegelian, Jani Polit, to present a comment, kind of a Hegelian comment of this piece of Verneinung, which he did, and then Lacan himself replied. So we'll go a little bit into this discussion. And then in the last part we'll embark through this question of negativity uh, on this kind of a more general theme of uh, nihilism, nihilism uh, started out from okay, Jacobi Nietzsche Brasier in his book on this Nihil Unbound, which is a very good book. I really strongly recommend its reading if you uh, know, don't know it yet. 
and in relation to this we'll also touch again some of the Nietzschean themes like the eternal return, the repetition, the dead drive again. So as you can see there is lots of things but uh, hopefully this perhaps uh, chaotic mess will find certain structure and logic as we, as we go along. Um, and uh, as you also probably know, since my kind of primary, primary orientation is uh, Lacanian, this will be more or less also what will um, govern uh, uh, my, my thinking here. Um, and I think I will simply uh, start today with a kind of a warming up introduction into this question of the real and the impossible. Uh, and first with some um, kind of, uh, I call this short inventory of the impossible, kind of a uh, short list of uh, what is happening with this notion today and how it works. Uh, and then we'll move on uh, to a more detailed discussion uh, of a philosopher whom I briefly uh, already discussed last year, who is Clemine Rousset and who has a seemingly very similar take on the real as the impossible. Um, uh, and uh, we'll, I will try to show a little bit, argue more in detail, what is the interest of Rousset's um, theory of the real uh, and also what are its difficulties and uh, uh, what perhaps are the answers to these difficulties. And then I think we'll, the, we'll conclude today um, with a kind of a more concrete discussion of what I would call one figure of the real, which is the figure of the double. And we'll uh, go a little bit into this also with concrete examples from Dostoevsky. So first, as I said, a kind of a short inventory of the impossible. You know that uh, I think one could say that uh, the question of the impossible is more and more imposing itself today from different directions and in different ways. And I think that this is uh, more or, or the more true because it appears somehow on both sides of the crossfire, I would say, of the diagnostics of our times. So on the one hand, it is possible to convincingly argue that the impossible is disappearing under the offensive of the, be it ideological or simply technological, or they are related anyway, imperative of the possible. You know, everything is possible, there is nothing we cannot do. The word is possible, is not in our dictionary at some time, as one hears. Um, and in relation to this, we are also dealing with a criticism sometimes of our world which registers as this kind of compulsive disappearance of the dimension of the impossible. Everything is transparent, possible and so on. And points out that what is disappearing with this impossible is also some kind of real ontological dimension in this ideological vortex of all the possibilities. But of course, on the other hand, one can also, and no less convincingly, argue that the dimension of the impossible is in fact persistently expanding. And that, for example, any real alternative to what is, is in advance classified as impossible, this, let's say, on this most general level then it's also the impossible which is massively intruding into our world in the form of different there are catastrophes or more individual scale. There is a kind of proliferation even of small impossibilities which are getting uh, multiplied uh, in our world under the pretense that they are protecting us from some kind of chaos that would um, happen otherwise. So on this side, we are dealing with the thesis that impossible is, in fact, augmenting. Um, and we can get the impression also sometimes that 
what we gain on one side, which is possible, we are losing on the other. For, for better or worse, but a great many things now, I'm speaking from this more mundane scale, a great many things that were possible and quite normal or common at some point in the past are becoming literally impossible or inimaginable. From little things like almost, not yet altogether, but almost smoking, for instance, I think it's a very good example of this, how it's I mean, really something almost unimaginable. Or, for instance, and I'm taking this example, which I think it's very witty from uh, Robert Fowler, the impossibility to consider the ending of a movie such as, for instance, The Graduate, you know, the movie with Dustin Hoffman from 67, the impossibility to consider the ending of this movie as happy end. This is a movie in which a young man has a relationship with older woman and then runs off with her daughter, who expects a child with another man, and the movie ends with uh, the couple in love escaping the family ties and ways. And it's definitely true that this kind of ending would hardly count as a happy ending these days. If the movie were done today, it would probably, or at best, be considered as a kind of a dry provocation or a, as a moral lecture about how not to conduct one's life. Then you have, you know, all this kind of contradiction between uh, great possibilities to travel, I don't know, in space and so on, to have our bodies change completely, but at the same time, the impossible to deal with, even in the cases of extreme poverty, let alone something a little bit more high in the scale of balancing the economic reality. So, and when speaking about the, this question precisely of the impossible and its disappearance, um, its disappearance at least in the form of things offering any real resistance, Gérard Vajman, who is a French philosopher and psychoanalyst, um, commented on one scene from the movie Blade Runner. I think it's a very good point that he made in relationship to this, you know, the movie from 82 of the last century, uh, he commented on this scene as anticipating and announcing this, precisely this term of events, this impossible uh, disappearing, the resistance, this disappearing. You know, towards the end of the movie, you have this scene in which the, the bad guy, or the replicant Roy, is chasing uh, the, um, the main protagonist, played by Harrison Ford, this Rick Deckard, and the Deckard is hiding behind a wall, uh, it's a kind of very beautiful scene, trembling behind this wall, but also somehow feeling safe behind it. And all of this, the sudden Roy simply penetrates the wall with his uh, wrist. So Harrison Ford on the other side hears Roy's voice, but he is supposedly safe on the other side of the wall. But suddenly Roy's hand simply breaks through the wall, grabbing the Deckard's hand as if he saw through the wall and as if this were absolutely no, uh, it, as if the wall offered absolutely no resistance to his head. Um, and Vajman says that once upon a time, the detective stories were often, you know, these locked room mysteries, which is no longer so. Precisely because in our world nothing is out of reach anymore. Bodies are constantly on display, nothing is sheltered. All matter can be profanated, no wall is impenetrable. And yet, and this, and this is, I think, what is more interesting to this kind of constatation, the same scene from Blade Runner is paradigmatic, especially for another reason. Through the wall has become tra transient, but only from one side, the side of the bad guys. So there is a kind of fundamental asymmetry at work in this disappearing of the impossible. And this is de definitely something that one can detect on all possible levels, this great mobility in space, how we can travel and move from one country to another, and of course, all these walls, invisible walls being put out in the case of immigrants and so on. 
And just to, there was a great example of this. I really laughed a lot when I heard it. Uh, example of piece of news from the Slovene TV uh, some time ago. I think it was a year ago or something. Uh, concerning precisely yet another revolutionary novelty expanding the limits of the possible. And this is how the journalist, how the news read. He said, today a first tourist has traveled into space at the price of four, $40 million. Never before, before has the space been so accessible to men as it is today. <laughs> so I think there we have it in a nutshell. I mean, the, the fact that the journalist didn't even notice the absurdity of linking together these two sentences in a, is, I think, in itself eloquent enough. Everything is possible. From now on, we can all travel into space. There is no longer any, let's say, symbolic or technical interdiction restricting, for instance, this kind of travel to astronauts and scientists. There is, of course, this one little insignificant obstacle. One needs to have $40 million. <laughs> But at the same time, of course, this is really not a surreal impossibility, just something that can eventually, we just need to make another effort, as the sad would say, and we are there. On the other hand, of course, economic impossibilities as such uh, themselves are also very much present and very often as this kind of a utterly unflexible and unavoidable natural <coughs> laws. So, of course, there is no, no doubt, I'm not uh, anti-technology here or something like this, there is no doubt that technological advances and scientific discoveries on which they are based can change the limit of the per parameters of the possible or even make the impossible happen in some way. Uh, but this precisely is not, of course, what is at stake in this example. The novelty reported in this piece of news is not some scientific discovery, it's simply commercialization of the space traveling, with the latter being quite possible before that. So this kind of commercialization, of course, demands important technical solutions, yet they are in no way related to the impossible in the strict sense of the word. Yet they are perfect for masking or shifting the debate from the impossible that does, in fact, structure the very field in which something like commercialization of space travel takes place, which is the economic field. So not simply the fact that people usually don't have 40 million to spend on a bit of space travel, but precisely the antagonism that structured this field in order to even produce this kind of economic logic or asymmetry. Uh, so the same wall looks like a great land of opportunities from the one side and as an unsurmountable obstacle from the other. But if we now ask or introduce into this the, the Lacanian notion of the real defined as the impossible, of course this is not simply to say that the real is simply on this other side, where the walls still hold, walls still hold and are even becoming thicker. The real, strictly speaking, is the very asymmetry or antagonism defining this kind of space. So it's not simply that Lacan saying that what is impossible is the real, so we have a kind of a sore compass of, of the real. Uh, he's saying that when we come across a serious impossibility, we can be sure to be also close to a logical impasse of a given structure, not something not simply some kind of economic difficulty that we can more or less easily surmount, but precisely some kind of a logical impasse of the very structure that presents this kind of asymmetry and for which this asymmetry is absolutely fundamental. It's inherent limit of possibility. Um, so to, to take the previous example, it is not that the transitivity of the wall and borders is less real than their intransitivity. One should not get this idea. They are both real in the sense that they both exist. For some it's like this, for some it's like that. They also exist for anybody to see. 
it, what is really is in the, uh, in the Lacanian sense is precisely this this case social impossible that only allows them to be as this symmetry. So the real, and we'll be coming to this uh, very often to, to this week, uh, the real in the Lacanian sense is not to be confused with being. Really it's not some being, not only some study. It's not, it is precisely a certain impulse, a certain develop of being itself, of ontology itself. And I will be speaking about this more uh, uh, in extenso. Uh, some later point. Um, so now, uh, to perhaps um, present this also through some kind of uh, comparison, uh, I will um, move on to present a little bit Clément Rousset, his idea of what is real uh, and what is our relationship to the real. Uh, to be able, as I said precisely, to uh, from a certain comparison to, uh, with his idea, which is, I think, quite inspiring, uh, develop more concretely, more more palpably, perhaps, today in this outline, what could be, what are the parameters of this Lacanian real that we'll be moving uh, in. So, uh, Clément Rousset, uh, French philosopher, contemporary French philosopher, strangely not very much translated out, outside, uh, outside France, uh, known precisely, it's even the, the, I think it's one of the last books, the um, compilation of his work, which is even called L'Ecole du Réel, the, the school of the real. So the real is the kind of a master signifier of his uh, entire work. And perhaps, although he has written a lot, I think that in the natural what his theory, this is probably uh, presented in this very sh short uh, book, Le Réel et son double, The Real and Its Double, which I think as such is not available in English, or perhaps it is part of some uh, collection. Um, and he's also an interesting, I think, figure to comment on here, uh, because he is somehow uh, perhaps one of the most interesting living Nietzscheans. He's, he's written, I don't know if he's written anything on Nietzsche, but he's definitely kind of a continuation of Nietzsche with his own means. And this is how he sees himself, but also how he's uh, generally perceived. There are lots of Nietzschean themes that he takes up and kind of develops them in uh, his own way. And, and this will be our also a way of, of keeping this seminar to a certain extent also under the sign of, um, of Nietzsche. So as I said, I did present some of this uh, last year in this evening lecture, but uh, I will now do it more in detail and I think it would be more possible to kind of get a precise idea of what his uh, uh, theory is and what, how could be kind of related to or unrelated to, to Lacan. Uh, so his basic argument is a very simple one. It's that he says that the real always tends to strike us as impossible to tolerate in some way. Either too cruel and disagreeable, or else too simple and idiotic. And more often than not, even this is the, the reason for strange reactions that we have to it. So, according to Rousseau, in our general relationship to the real, um, our attitude betrays both anxiety and, uh, and contempt or disregard. Anxiety as to the fact that the real is really only just what is it? What have, is it really just this? And, and the coextensive contempt for the real in its, its uh, idiotic simplicity and plainness. And hence a whole number of strategies that aim uh, at circumventing the real and either replacing it with something else, which we then declare to be the actual, the true real. This is obviously the basic gesture. So, uh, there is always the true real, that one. Uh, and this is the double, precisely, the real and its double. So, on the basis of numerous examples, he develops um, a lucid and often amusing analysis of these strategies. 
which all have their this common denominator, the redoubling duplication of the real and the enthronement of its double. And he proposes generally three main headings under which he discusses this structure, namely the prophetic illusion, what he calls the event and its double, so prophecies, and we'll be discussing also some of this today. Uh, then what he calls metaphysical illusion, the word and its double, and here he basically places into this, under this heading, all the philosophy, the metaphysical tradition at least, um, and the religion, of course. There is the preoccupation of philosophy and metaphysics is precisely to construct, to construct the, the really real world, so to say. And psychoanalysis is also more or less uh, seen as something that uh, enters here. This kind of, for him, the, the very uh, concepts of the symbolic and so on as the real scene of something which interests psychoanalysis is the very sign that there is something uh, uh, of the redoubling of this awareness going on. And then the psychological illusion Man and his double, and here uh, we, we, come, we come across something that we'll also discuss in some detail, the, the literary figure of the double, but also a kind of psychotic breakdown, breakdown that can entail this kind of uh, event or illusion, the double appearing. So, uh, first I think that if Already, if you just think of these examples or these three headings that I uh, enumerated, uh, one can perhaps already see that the, the notion of the real and of its redoubling that uh, Rousseau presents via all these different examples and modalities is not, I think, as uniform as uh, Rousseau pretends. Uh, but uh, in fact involves at least two different notions. Uh, one implies a real that I think roughly corresponds to one of these notions. In one of these notions the real roughly corresponds to let's say reality with all its difficulties and inconveniences and in relation to which we have the habit of practicing a whole lot of illusions to borrow Rousseau's own term. But of course his notion of illusion is very specific, and it refers neither simply to some erroneous perception um, nor to denial. It corresponds to the following configuration. We correctly perceive a thing or a situation and do not deny this perception, but we refuse the consequences that should normally follow from it. The conclusion or the, is, the, is wrong. And his funniest example uh, is a comic play uh, by Georges Courtelin, uh, Bouboroche. This is a comic play from 1893. And he quotes this uh, rather famous scene in which Bouboroche uh, learns at some point, uh, a hint, of course, from a, from a friendly neighbor, that uh, his lover, Adele, is regularly cheating on him with a young lover. And what's more, in the very apartment he put her in. Uh, so he shows there by surprise and finds the lover in the closet, of course. Uh, but Adele is instantly manages to convince him that in spite of what he sees, she is perfectly innocent. And that it is Bouboroche himself who is guilty of unspeakable vulgarity for busting on her like this. And it in fact, it is he who has to apologize and ask for her forgiveness, which he does, actually, and becomes at the same time very furious with the neighbor who misinformed him. So, so according to Rousseau, this is a typical situation of this kind. There is something that we see, but the conclusion we get from this is the, the opposite of what we see. So the action would be, I quote Rousseau, there is a lover in Adele's closet, he never denies seeing this, therefore Adele is innocent and I am not a cuckold. This would be kind of a matem of 
what he describes as the structure of illusion. So at stake is not uh, at stake in this notion of illusion is uh, the following configuration. It is not that I don't want to see, I don't deny the real that I see, but this is as far as I'm prepared to go. I saw, I admitted, but not ask any more of me. In the rest, I maintain my previous position and beliefs. I go on as before, as if I saw nothing. And I think uh, what can immediately, one can immediately see how Rousseau's description here actually corresponds point by point to what uh, psychoanalysis conceptualized with the notion of disavowal, that is the uh, Verleugnung, it's the Freud, Freud term, this fetishist disavowal, who ha which has precisely this structure of, I know very well that this is how things stand, but nevertheless I continue to behave as if it was not so. I think this is I think that all in all, this concept of disavowal comes closer to the mark of what Rousseau is describing here than simply redoubling for illusion, perhaps. But, so this is one way, one modality of the examples that uh, Rousseau presents. But there is another group or another uh, bunch of examples which from where one can kind of uh, deduce another notion of the real and of the redoubling at work, um, and which I think that cannot be reduced to this logic of illusion is the duplication of or disavowal. Uh, and they can have perhaps even more far reaching or interesting structure. And these are examples of the oracular prophetic, prophetic literature. Uh, and I will simply read you Crusades, which is, I think, Crusades crucial and masterful observation in respect to prophecies. And I uh, apologize to those who already know this uh, quote. Um, so this is the quote. Oracles have a general and at the same time paradoxical characteristic that they come true and that they surprise with this very coming true. The oracle does us the favor of announcing the event in advance, so that the one for whom this event is destined has the leisure to prepare for it and eventually to try to ward it off. The event is fulfilled such as it has been predicted or announced by a dream or some other sort of premonitory manifestation. And yet this fulfillment has a curious fortune of disappointing the expectation at the very moment when the later would have to see itself as utterly fulfilled. A is announced, A happens, and we are lost, at least to some extent. Between the event such that it has been announced and the event such that it was fulfilled, there is a kind of a subtle difference that suffices to baffle the very person who has been expecting precisely that what he is witnessing. He recognizes it all right, but he no longer recognizes himself in it. Yet nothing happened but the announced event. But the latter is inexplicably R. So you can see how this, uh, I think how the, 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 the landscape changes a little bit with, with this example. And um, we see, of course, supports this observation with numerous uh, other uh, numerous examples of prophecies precisely, uh, there is of course an old Arab tale that has seen many different versions, among which uh, also the uh, Somerset Moss version, version the appointment in Samara, and I will simply read you this, it's uh, one paragraph, it's a very uh, interesting piece written by Somerset Moss, uh, because the speaker is dead actually, and this is how it goes. There was a merchant in Baghdad who sent his servant to market to buy provisions and in a little while the servant came back, white and trembling, and said, Master, just now when I was in the marketplace I was jostled by a woman in the crowd and when I turned I saw it was that that jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. 
Now let me your horse and then go right away from this city and avoid my fate. I will go to Samara and there that will not find me. The merchant led him his horse and the servant mounted it and he dug his spurs in its flanks and as fast as the horse could gallop he went. Then the merchant went down to the marketplace and he saw me there standing in the crowd and he came to me and said, why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? It was not a threatening gesture, I said, it was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. So you know, this is the, you probably know the story. Um, and it's actually, I think, quite interesting that, uh, that Mo decided that that would be precisely the one with whom this kind of coincidence and non-coincidence would take place. So uh, then, of course, uh, the most famous of these stories is uh, Oedipus the King. And if you think of it, it is very true that although what eventually takes place in this tragedy corresponds exactly to what has been predicted, we together, uh, we together with Oedipus cannot help but be very much at loss when it happens or when it turns to be what actually happened. So, and, so you see, places this subtle difference that suffices to baffle the very person who has been expecting precisely what uh, he is witnessing at the core of what he recognizes as splitting or duplication of the real at work in a quasi general way in our attitude toward the world. So, you can see that the example of a fulfilled prophecy elucidates for, you see, this general propensity to duplication by precisely presenting its other side. It confronts us with an unwelcome and surprising coincidence at a point where our normal existence would be more than satisfied with a split or non-coincidence between two versions or two meanings of the real. So we tend to put the real aside and to install a double in its place. A double that has the advantage of suiting us better. However, and here I'm still following to say, as it is clear from these stories that treat the theme of the double and this kind of proper prophecies, there is no possible double of the real. The latter always wins in its singularity, eliminating the other person or the other version of the event. So any kind of a double of the real is impossible since the real is by definition the same, the singular. So what happens with the fulfilled, fulfillment of a prophecy is that the expected event coincides with itself and this is the very source of our surprise. For we have been somehow expecting something different, albeit akin to it, not the same thing, but not exactly like this. And I think this is uh, also what uh, allows uh, Rousseau to accomplish the following, I think, rather nice interpretative period, reversing the standard perspective according to which the tragic character of tragedies, such as Oedipus, for example, results from the ambiguity, from double meaning of the prophetic words. Of course, there is ambiguity inherent to prophecy, as well as playing with double meanings, which can be encountered both in tragedies and prophecies. Yet this ambiguity does not consist in one word splitting in two or more meanings, but on the contrary, the very coincidence of two meanings of which we retrospectively find out that there were only apparently two, but in fact one. And so for uh, to say it was the king is, the tra is, is a tragedy of coincidence and inambiguity and not of ambiguity. So the play evolves in the direction of an inexorable return to one and only to the singular, eliminating from the scene, from one scene to the next, 
precisely this illusion, this feeling of a possible redoubling of a possible alternative reality, so to say, the illusion of a possible another me. And this is also, of course, why the, the very sentiment of being somehow deceived, cheated, uh, which always accompanies, for to say, this kind of realization of prophecy, and which is also Oedip's sentiment, you know, that he is precisely complaining on being, on being, or, or being cheated. This itself, the peak of illusion. There is a deception involved in all this all right, but not where we see it. We are deceived by the very impression that we have been deceived, that something else should in fact have happened. But the only illusion here is the illusion that we have been cheated and that the realized event took the place of something else. So I think you get a, you can get already a rather good idea from that what kind of concept of the real is coming through this uh, development of of Rousseau's. Um, the real is something somehow, although it's getting more and more complicated then as, as he goes on with his work, is out there as some singular and homogeneous in itself, indistinguishable somehow from its meaning. Then the other meaning, which can remain unspecified, is kind of a result of the subjective will to illusion that accompanies the impossibility of our relationship to, to the real and the singularity. So the coincidence between two meanings that present such a surprise and event for the subject is in fact only a mirage an effect of a perspective illusion, which so double where there was never more than just a singular real, a singular meaning. Okay, so, but not afraid, let's say, of being cast as Rossi's caricature of Lacanianism, I am tempted to ask, is this really all there is to these examples? Or from them. Can the per perplexity and surprise that accompany a fulfillment of prophecy really be reduced to a, for instance, subjective or even psychologically motivated, who say speaks of debout and effroi in face of the unique psychologically motivated reaction to this illusion? I think Perhaps, uh, if we only stop, stop to think of it on a rather uh, empirical level, uh, Rousseau's theory is put in a somehow <coughs> problematic light already uh, by the following simple fact. There exists a perplexed surprise at the same, at the expected, which is not a disappointment, but joy, for instance. There exists a joyful, or to use the Nietzschean term, gay, surprise at the same, at the expected, yet which is still a surprise. Of course, one can immediately think of a general example, which would be the example of positive prophecies. Say that, I don't know, an oracle predicts that I will win the lottery, and then I win the lottery. I think I will still be very much surprised. So there is this kind of redoubling. Uh, we can agree probably that the realization that the coming through of, an pro of any prophecy, also a positive one, is accompanied, I think in this respect he's quite right, Rossi, by an effect of astonishment, surprise, disbelief that this is truly what happened. Um, and perhaps this example is even clearer for what plays an important part, of course, in negative prophecies is also the fact that we try to prevent them from coming true and with these very actions create the conditions of their happening. So that is to say that in the case of positive prophecies we are also dealing with a split and a redoubling. Yet, which is, could not be at least not psychologically motivated by the resistance to 
what is there, for we are quite happy about what is there. There is one other royal example of this, which is love, and which I spoke yesterday. I will not go into this uh, today, but there is a simple, similar kind of a joyful surprise, a kind of uh, strange coincidence of the same uh, that Rousseau himself describes as a surprise that you are you. Three, eight, one. So I think the question that can arise with this surprising, always surprising, and I think this element of surprise is something that at least can get us on the way of thinking that perhaps we are close to something that could be uh, thought of as the real in this Lacanian sense. Uh, the question that can answer this surprising coincidence of two meanings uh, described by Rousseau is, of course, where exactly is the real situated here? Is it simply situated in one of the two meanings? Its ontological singularity of this one to mean its coincidence with the being. As Rousseau seems to suggest, whereby the tragic path of shattering the illusion leads through precisely the elimination of the other meaning and presents the return to the singular. Or, this would be, for instance, Another possibility, the real is not one of the two meanings, but what occurs or comes forth in their very coincidence. Not the singularity of meaning, but of the impasse or impossible to which they both in their very split view form. And I guess this is again something that will be coming through, I think, all, all along uh, this week to this specific notion of the real, uh, which is also part of what, uh, what is implied in the psychoanalytic theory of repetition, where again we have, and the double, of course, to a certain extent at least, is already involved in the logic of repetition, but the real is precisely not simply something that is repeated, but it is repeated, it is the impasse that is repeated with the means, let's say, of the, the, the reality. Uh, and the repetition of this coincidence, or the coincidence itself that can be, uh, you know, that there are these kind of examples that Freud gives about strange uh, repetition which seems to be completely outside subjective or rich, uh, like fate repeating itself, he quotes uh, an example of a woman actually three times married a man who then immediately fell ill and she had to take care of him for like a long time before he died. So it was a kind of a, something that one can literally not predict or choose to happen because it all happened by coincidence. But nevertheless, this coincidence did repeat itself several times. Um, so, I think uh, there are a few problems related to Rousseau's stance in this, in this respect. Uh, first is, of course, that somehow, in the first step, he blends together two things which he then stubbornly tries to separate, namely precisely the symbolic and the real. And, of course, it is quite astonishing that Rousseau bases his discussion of the real on the phenomenon of prophecy, which is a symbolic phenomenon par excellence, and which clearly testifies that the symbolic is not simply a, I don't know, distortive or sim symbolist replication of the real, but that their relationship precisely is much more twisted. But prophecy is not some, simply some kind of a, a duplicate uh, put on the real such as it is. So the, the surprise, even shock that accompanies the realization of a prophecy is no doubt linked to the fact that the word directly coincides with the real. Yeah, we could say this, but not simply in the sense that it ac uh, uh, accurately describes some real, that it describes it without alternation, 
the point is precisely that the prophetic word somehow walks right into what returns from the real because this prophetic word was given. So there is a certain very important dialectics involved here, which is not simply, I think this is also an important point to make, which is not simply that symbolic creates the real which to which then it responds. It does, but not in the sense that it creates it as a symbolic entity. Uh, it is something that uh, it is, is created on top of the symbolic reality created by the symbolic, which has the consequences of the real, which then propels uh, in return the very uh, construction, there is the symbolic response to it. So there is a certain uh, important dialectics of three elements, I would, I would say, and this third element, or to some extent, third reality, um, as, as I will also call it, perhaps with Laplanche, is something also that we will try to link to the Lacanian notion <coughs> of the real. So, if there is some, if there are things that are symbolically uh, constructed. There, also, there is also something that is created on top of these symbolic constructions, where they are created, and which somehow influence the very space, of the very field of the symbolic, uh, which, which constitute the point of its inherent impasse, in response to which the symbolic then gets entangled into this kind of duplications and further uh, constructions. But we'll also come to this uh, more in detail at some uh, later point. Now, just to say that the, the, the stories about fulfilled prophecies are telling really the opposite, I think, of stories that simply lament the derealization of human life uh, in and because of the symbolic, or its irredeemable separation from the real. We can have problems when attempting somehow, some perspectives at least, to reach the real by means of the symbolic. Yes, there is a real that reaches us because certain words have been uttered. And there is uh, also a certain asymmetry here that needs to be noted. So this reading uh, doesn't go exactly in the opposite direction than Rousseau's. Yet, yet I think it suggests a different topology precisely of the real and the symbolic and of their extimate relation. The symbolic is not something that covers up the real, puts a blanket over it. The symbolic is an autonomous edifice, yes, constructed in view of a certain impasse. And it is this impasse that Lacan calls the real. So the real is not simply some awful, raw or bare reality, but more like it's structuring contradiction, impossibility, impasse. And in order to, I think we will yeah, have, uh, to perhaps uh, come closer to, to, to this structure, uh, I will, we will look now a little bit more closely to a quote or passage uh, from television. It's Lacan's text also. He appeared on the television. Uh, and uh, trying to precisely get to what would this third uh, point be, this third element in this individuality of of the real and the, uh, and the symbolic, or the reality and the symbolic. And this quote actually starts out from the question of the relationship between repression and suppression. Repression is here the translation of uh, Verdrängung, repression in the psychoanalytic sense, which is why suppression, the word suppression is used for what we usually refer to as repression, social repression and so on. So it starts out from here, and you can see it is a question of precisely, uh, seemingly, something that happens in the uh, outside reality, 
the suppression, family suppression, terror, and the, the repression, kind of psychological response to this. And Lacan actually not only turns this upside down, but also hints at uh, this kind of the distortion of these two elements in a perspective of something third again, which is precisely the real that one needs to take into account also. So first let me just read you this quote. It says, Freud didn't say that repression, verdrängung, comes from su su suppression. The greediness by which he characterizes the superego is structural, not an effect of civilization, but discontent symptom in civilization. So that we have to re-examine the test case, taking as a starting point the fact that it is repression that produces suppression. So that it is actually the verdrängung that produces suppression. Why couldn't the family, society itself, be creations built from repression, verdrängung? There are nothing less. Even if the memories of familiar suppression weren't true, they would have to be invented, and this is certainly done. That's what myth is, the, the attempt to give an epic form to what is operative through the structure. The sexual impasse excludes the fiction, ex, uh, not excludes, sorry, exudes the fictions that rationalize the impossible within which it originates. I don't say they are ima imagined. Like Freud, I read in them the invitation to the real that underwrites them. So, you see, there is in this quote that even if the memories of the familiar suppression weren't true, they would have to be invented, or perhaps one could even say they would have to be uh, performed. Uh, a certain uh, curving of the space of the relationship precisely between the, uh, the repression and the suppression. Uh, it is not simply that, let's say, this would be a kind of conservative reading, that there is a certain real, some real problem, and the uh, symbolic impossibility, of the, let's say a law or an interdiction or a myth, simply consists in giving a symbolic form to some really possibility, something that is already uh, there. So it is not simply interdiction of something, the symbolic law, which is in itself uh, impossible, at least not in this direct way. For instance, incest is not forbidden because it is impossible to sleep with one's parents. It's not impossible, I mean, empirically, it's quite possible. It is rather that the prohibition of incest as one of the fundamental prohibitions gives precisely the epic form to the impossible that structures sexuality as such. And which is precisely, the, in this case, the impasse, the logical impasse also of the given symbolic structure. So it is not, uh, the, the impossible is precisely not simply something that cannot be empirically done, it is a structural possibility, something that lacks, let's say, the real that lacks precisely reality with which, to which the uh, symbolic myth or law responds, uh, not directly, but precisely in this epic or mythical form. And precisely speaking about the prohibition of the incest, Lacan says, for example, the backing, presentation in French, organized by the fundamental fact that namely the prohibition of the incest, is the packing organized by the fundamental fact that there is no possible place in the mythical union that would be defined as sexual between men and women. So there is a certain uh, structural impossibility or impasse, which is the real structure in the very field of the symbolic uh, and to which the symbolic responds by a certain uh, construction or a certain uh, yeah, construction. And this is why these constructions are not simply imagined or pure constructions, but because we can read in them the invitation to the real that 
underlined. You can see them as a kind of an amorphic picture of something that is in fact a pointer to, uh, to a real problem. So symbolic does not replace the real, nor does it express it, or symbolize it, or represent it, or even come after it. It is you know, something that actually takes place at the same time. The symbolic is not, the real is not pre-symbolic or something. What it does is that it responds to its own, one could also put it this way, to its own real in a necessarily displaced way, always necessarily displaced. Symbolic is, a, one could also say, a mythical form of its own real, of its own impasse, of the point precisely where it, it, it itself lacks being. It confronts its own structural impossibility or incoherence, not some supposedly outside uh, real. Uh, and in, in this respect, it is actually very important to, to, um, to point to, to, to a certain point, which I think is absolutely crucial for the, um, the very definition of what psychoanalysis is about, what is its object of inquiry, of investigation, and so on, and which has a lot to do precisely with what I'm trying to and of sketch here with this term of a third reality of a third element that is not reducible to this kind of a, um, uh, a position or alternative between simply psychic reality and material reality or empirical reality. And uh, this, in fact, is something that, um, for instance, uh, uh, Laplanche, Jacques Laplanche very well saw. I think I, I mean, there are lots of points where one would not agree with him, but this problem, he saw it from the very outset, and he uh, very much detected the point where Freud himself was kind of oscillating, and at this point where Freud was oscillating is his, in his theory was also the very point of the, let's say, what was the real of psychoanalytic theory itself. You know, the, the, the example is, you know, that Freud first posited the, the sexual seduction of children by adults as something real. You know, this was the first approach, something um, uh, as a factual or empirical event in the child history, which is then repressed and can become, for instance, the ground or the cause of different symptoms and neurotic disturbances. This was the first kind of rough input theory. But later on, he abandoned this theory altogether in f favor of a theory of the fantasy of seduction. But generally speaking, seduction is not an event that takes place in empirical reality, but is but the fantasy constructed later on, subsequently, in the period of our sexual awareness, and it only exists in the psychical, psychical reality of the subject. And of course, if approached with the tool of the distinction between simply material reality and psychical reality or fantasy, then the question of seduction leads to this kind of impasse situation where either we have to claim that everything finally is material seduction for how exactly are we to isolate and define the later. Is it, I don't know, a nursing a baby, is it touching its lips or its bottom already a seduction? Or when we need pressed to say yes, everything is a seduction, or else it leads to the conclusion that seduction is entirely fantasmatic, mediated entirely by the psychical reality of one who feels seduced. And of course, you know what are the downsides of this kind of approach. And Laplanche here already has a very good answer uh, to, to this supposed, supposed conflict between raw materialism and psychological idealism, we could call them this way. And um, this uh, reply is, I think, profoundly materialistic in the sense that he recognizes a properly material cause, yet a cause that cannot be reduced to or deduced from what has empirically happened. In, for instance, this is his example, the interaction between the, the child and the adult. 
So, according to, uh, to Laplace, you probably uh, know this theory, the trigger of the subsequent constitution also of the unconscious lies neither in the raw material reality nor in the reality of fantasy, but is the very materiality of a third reality which is kind of transversal to the other two and which he calls the material reality of the enigmatic message. Um, and simply put, the idea is that, for instance, in their interaction with adults, children keep receiving messages that are always partly enigmatic, written with the unconscious of the other, which is also to say, of course, by his or her sexuality. So this means that this kinds of messages are not enigmatic only for those who receive them, but also for those from whom they come. They do not, properly speaking, understand them themselves, what they are saying, conveying, whatever, or know exactly what they are conveying. So these messages, which of course do not need to be verbal, have their own material reality. They are not fantasies, or, a, or kind of a posteriori constructions, yet they are also not a direct sexual seduction. So according to Laplanche, the child interprets these messages and organizes, uh, synthesizes them in a more or less coherent, meaningful story. And however, the interpretation, the explanation, understanding of these messages always has its other or backside, places where this explanation does not work, places that are left out of the interpretation, places where we are dealing with the leftover which is then repressed. That is to say we are dealing here with the constitution of the unconscious as the is refused, the shape of interpretation of enigmatic messages. This is basically the planche account. Although I think one should perhaps stop here and consider for a moment asking the following question, namely, is not that Laplanche is here in this presenting of the, the things, presentation of the things moving a little bit too fast and precisely uh, um, identifying, putting together, fusing together two different things and thus redu reducing the very tripartite structure which he himself has put such emphasis on to a simpler binary structure, namely. In the account, as, as I just sketched it out, we end up with two elements. On the one side, we have the conscious, let's say the manifest content of interpretive narration, the symbolic, and on the other side, the unconscious as the non-digested or non-digestible piece of the other's message the piece that has not been integrated into the given interpretation. But what we lose by putting things this way, I think, is that the unconscious itself is, was also already an interpretation. In other words, we should not simply identify the refuse, the shape, the invisible remi uh, indivisible reminder of the interpretation of the enigmatic message with the unconscious. I think we should rather say that the unconscious, the work of the unconscious, as well as its formations, is, what is precisely kind of interpretation which strives to incorporate this piece, this, to use now the Lacan's notion, object, all and out object, into its narrative. You could say the unconscious is what interprets by taking this leftover into account somehow is producing this kind of strange illogical formations. It interprets with respect to it precisely. So if the constitution of the unconscious does in fact coincide with a certain, let's say, conscious interpretation taking place, with a certain solution that is given to the enigmatic message, this does not mean that the unconscious is simply what is left outside and is not included into our conscious interpretation. Rather, I would say the unconscious is that which continues to interpret 
after the conscious interpretation is done. Or even more precisely, it is that which starts to interpret after some understanding of the enigmatic message is produced. This is for what it uh, interprets <coughs> is, to put it bluntly, precisely the relationship between the given interpretation, our representation of reality, of reality if we want how we perceive of it, and its left over. It is precisely this relationship that it tries to re-establish again and again. And what's more, we could, see that we could say that it interprets from the point of view of this left over. This is also the reason why the unconscious formations are by definition compromised formations, as they are called. But we should perhaps add to this that the, 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 the very thing that compromises them, so to say, is also the thing that brings them closer to the real. So this real which they repeat precisely from one interpretation to another, and which also only exists in this gap of between these different interpretations. And this fact that I mean, the unconscious interprets from the point of view of the left over, I think is the very reason also why this particular interpretation is not simply an interpretation of interpretation of interpretation with all the, let's say, relativism implied in this formulation, but is inscribed instead in the dimension of truth, in its relationship precisely to the real that is speaking at that point. Um, and I think this is what, why psychoanalysis puts its stakes on when ta taking the unconscious formations seriously, not simply as some kind of deformations of this or that, but also pointers to a certain real which is not a simply subjective real. I mean, this is, I, I hope this is clear from what I've been saying so far. That it is not simply that, I'm not simply speaking of the real of this or that uh, traumatized subject. There is something of the real of the very structure that uh, that is played with each particular subjective destiny, in which particular subjective destiny, in which is not reduced or reducible to uh, his or her psychological, even unconscious singularity. There is something that uh, uh, is not simply psychological or subjective in this sense, but that precisely um, uh, that what connects to the very, put it very uh, massively, what connects to the very ontological pinnacle structure of, of, the, of the reality. And it is precisely at the point where we think we are at the most intimate of the subjective psychological dimension that we can hit upon something that is actually objective in the more strong, stronger sense of the word. And this kind of point, this kind of an impasse, or this kind of a uh, whole is precisely what uh, I think the main um, effort and work of psychoanalysis, radical and practical, is, is about. Uh, so just to uh, once more slightly uh, recapitulate this uh, Laplanche's um, theory and then we'll stop for, for a pause. Um, we are dealing with three elements, I would say. A specific, let's say, subjective figure related to the formations of the unconscious. And then we have like two kinds of causes. One kind consists of elements, be it words or gestures, gazes and so on, that constitute what Laplanche calls the enigmatic messages circulating in the other. So here we have the kind of realm of the other. And the other cause is this strange objective or object-like 
surplus left over of the interpretation of these uh, messages. And I would further add that this leftover is not simply some element of the message, let's say one word or one gesture or one gaze which was left outside the interpretation, but is rather something like an objectivation of a certain quality that this element, an effective quality that this element can have in relation to the, uh, to the, in this case, interpreting subject. So, I think Laplanche calls this quality enigmatic, but for certain reasons I think it, it would be better to call it problematic. It refers to the fact that there is always, yeah, something, Kierkegaardski clause, something that doesn't work in the relationship between subject and the other, or in the relationship between subjects being and meaning and so on. This relationship is built on an uh, irreducible difficulty which is also inscribed in the religious part of the real. Um, and for our purposes here, we could simply say that the objective leftover of the interpretation is the very mode in which this difficulty materially exists. Yes, it could be a gesture word, but this gesture is precisely the, uh, in its um, the attempts to incorporate it into, into a coherent interpretation are precisely the means of repeating something perhaps even more fundamental, which is the very impasse of this structure, the very uh, incompleteness, to a certain extent, of the, uh, of the very ontological structure that underpins it. So neither the subject nor the other have this kind of object, although it is somehow related to both. It is what relates or binds them, the two, in their very heterogeneity, in the very inexistence, so to say, of their common denominator. Okay, I think I will uh, just stop here for a moment, and then uh, uh, after the pause, uh, we will we'll return a little bit to, uh, to Rossi and then we'll try to see in what way the figure of the double, the ritual the figure of the double, uh, can be one way of seeing what, uh, what is this kind of uh, the real that I'm trying to, um, quite aware of, like, uh, to first just circumscribe in some way what its structure would